Jim, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me today. Why don't we start off with your background, sort of where you came from, the arc of your career, and what you're working on now? Yeah, so obviously these days I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of Utah, and I study and teach about politics and in particular Congress. And I think my path to getting here really started in college, where I really started to develop a strong interest in politics. Uh, if you had asked me at 18 or 19, I said, would have said I was going to be a politician because you know that political bug bit me at that point in my life. And I did everything I could to be engaged in politics. I worked with the college Democrats in my local college. I worked with the local party. I got involved wherever I could. And I did a congressional internship when I was in college with uh, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin. And that was sort of the most crystallizing moment for me because I got to go to DC. I spent all this time in, in Congress, a lot of time in the Capitol building, observing what was going on there and participating in it. And that's really made clear to me that the thing that I was most driven by was trying to understand how that place worked and why it worked the way it did. And that was sort of a, that was a very crystallizing moment where I switched in my head from necessarily wanting to spend time working in politics or working on Capitol Hill to doing what I could to understand the place, to research the place, to write about the place and help other people understand it too. And so that led me to seek a PhD in government and politics. Uh, ultimately at the University of Maryland, where I focused on my research on Congress. I continued working on and off Capitol Hill during that time. So I spent some time with the House Appropriations Committee while I was in graduate school. And then after graduate school, I spent time as a American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow with Representative Dan Lipinski, who recently uh, left Congress. And you know, eventually found myself uh, coming out to Utah where I've spent the last several years researching, writing, teaching about mainly the U.S. Congress. So your time on the Hill, could you talk a little bit more about that? Were you involved in committee work or was it personal office and what kinds of activities were you involved in and what were some of the striking things that you saw during that time that kind of shaped your later thinking? Yeah. So, you know, the obviously the internship was formative just because it, it grew the interest there, but my my real understanding of the place really started when I spent time as a member of the of House, the House Appropriations Committee staff. I was uh, a really low level staffer on the subcommittee on at the time that was called financial services and general government. Um, it doesn't even exist as a subcommittee anymore. It was created and then it was split back up not long after that. And this was in 07, I believe. Um, and the, so this was when the Democrats had first taken the house back after the 06 midterm elections and they were doing some reforms to their earmarking procedures. And so they wanted somebody who was willing to spend all day researching background on earmark requests. And I, all I wanted was to be able to have more time and access to Capitol Hill to help me with my understanding of the place and with my study of it in graduate school. And so, so I, like, I applied and offered my services and that's what I did all day. But in return, I got to watch everything that happened in the subcommittee. I got to see the process of them putting together their appropriations bill for that year and building support within the subcommittee and then building support within the committee and then going to the floor and then taking it over to the Senate side. And that experience really had one of the most crystallizing moments for me in terms of what I was going to eventually do my dissertation on and write my first book on, which was, you know, they spent all this time, as we did as a staff, writing this bill draft. And then obviously there's members of the subcommittee, both Democrats and Republicans, and we didn't share the draft with them in like the kind of open and like straightforward manner that you might suspect happens on Capitol Hill. Uh, we didn't like finish the draft and then give copies to all the offices and say, hey, you know, let us know what you think. We put copies of the bill in a conference room um, in, the, in one of the Capitol complex office buildings, one copy per member office. And each one had the member's office name at the top. And each office had one hour to send a staffer to come take a look at the bill in the room and then leave and they couldn't take it with them. And that was the only access that members of the subcommittee had to the actual bill draft before the markup on the committee. And at the time I was like, why is this happening? Why wouldn't you share the copy of the bill with members of the subcommittee, even the members of your own party? And what I came to realize is that the best way, if you're a committee, if you're in a leadership position in, in Congress to like, get the outcome you want is to not give people a whole lot of opportunities to find out what they don't like about it. You wanna keep it under wraps. And it wasn't necessarily that they were worried about every single member of the subcommittee digging too much into it. They didn't want leaks. They didn't want the bill 
draft to get beyond that. They didn't want anybody talking to somebody else about what was in the draft. They didn't want a copy of it to magically appear on the internet or in some trade group or lobbyist organization's office. They wanted to make sure that people, members of the subcommittee came in, they saw the bill, they heard about why it was a good draft, and then they would support it. And we could move it along the process without things getting blown up through somebody's opposition to this piece or that piece. As they always said, it's a carefully crafted balance that we have in this bill and we shouldn't mess with it. And that was really interesting to me because that sort of set me off on this path of seeking to understand how who has information and who doesn't affects who has power and who doesn't in the, in the Capitol. And also how different actors in Washington work to try to use information and control information in ways that help them get the outcomes that they want. Fascinating. And so you spent time on this committee and what were the other, was any of that time in a personal office or was it all committee based? None of that was in a personal office. Later, at, after graduate school, I went back and worked in the personal office of Representative Dan Lipinski and kind of got a whole new tutorial on uh, like the control of information from that side of things where and when I was on committee staff where I got to live the world of denying information to people. And then once I was a personal office staffer and sort of a typical member of Congress's office, I had to live the life of constantly trying to find out information about what was going on so I could make recommendations to my boss about what he should do. And so for like between those two experiences, I really got to experience both sides of that equation and see how it really affects what you're able to do and how you have to go about your business on Capitol Hill. Excellent. Well, I think that leads into the, the broader question of your research interests. I think you've You've stated them there, but would you mind sort of just recapping overall, since you've gone into academia, uh, what is your overall kind of interest in research? And then we'll dig more deeply into the congressional specific stuff. Yeah, I mean, the big questions are really just, I mean, at 30,000 feet, I study Congress and I study its role in national politics and policymaking. And the overriding questions have, have been now for some time, who has influence over decisions made on Capitol Hill? Why do some people have more power than others in this respect? And what are the consequences of those distributions of power among different members, among different offices, among different parts of the Capitol? All right, well, let's get into the detail. I know you have a book that specifically looks at this issue as it, regard, as it regards leadership. Yeah. Um, so can you talk more about your research area there? What are the questions you were asking and what answers did you find? So the big question for that book, for Legislating in the Dark, which was my first book, was why do party leaders in Congress appear to have so much power? And to what degree does, there, does information and knowledge and expertise play a role in leadership power in Congress? And in the book, I actually dig both into party leadership power and committee leadership power. So the power of committee chairs, which I argue works the same. But what I found is that in today's Congress, often leadership power is executed through what I term in the dark lawmaking or in the dark legislating, which largely has three components. Um, in recent years, parties and members of the parties in Congress have delegated substantial authority to their party leaders to essentially run the show, to set the agenda, to take the lead in the development of major policymaking efforts behind the scenes, to take a lead on negotiations with the other party or with the Senate or with the White House, and to largely micromanage the consideration of legislation on the House and Senate floor. So as a result of this, party leaders, as well as relevant committee leaders, some relevant committee chairs, typically possess far more information than other members of Congress about the major policymaking efforts that are happening on Capitol Hill. Um, they are the ones that are centrally involved in the discussions about how to draft the legislation. They're the ones that are involved centrally in the negotiations over what will and will not be included in the legislative package that's put together. And this makes them not only, this not only gives them tons of, inf tons of influence over what actually is in the laws, but it also makes them an important source of information for backbench or rank and file members of Congress about what is going on, what is being included in the bill and what is being left out and why, and what happened in the negotiations with the other party or with the Senate or with the White House. Few other members are privy to any of that information. They weren't there, they were not in the room. And so they have to turn to these leaders to get that information and to essentially get cues in order to figure out what are they going to support and what are they going to oppose and why. And so as a result, party leaders and committee leaders are effectively able to persuade their members of their members and their party often to get on board with what the plan is. 
uh, they're able to essentially also exacerbate the informational disparity between leadership and rank and file, often by keeping negotiations even more secretive and behind closed doors. And then once a deal is cut, moving very quickly to vote on the passive passage of what are often very large legislative packages that include many, many different provisions once an agreement is finally reached. In this way, this keeps most members of Congress, most rank and file members of Congress, effectively in the dark as to what's going on, what's being negotiated, and what it will ultimately be in the final pass package. And that consequently makes them more reliant on the information being provided by those same leaders about whether or not they should support the package. And we see these kinds of legislating in the dark tactics all the time. This is essentially how House Republicans managed their repeal and, repeal and replace effort with the Affordable Care Act in 2017. I don't know if you recall, but there was this moment of Senator Rand Paul going on a scavenger hunt through the Capitol to try to find a copy of the bill, which was largely for publicity, but it's true. Like there was not a readily available like draft copy that the leadership was keeping that kind of locked up as they negotiated things. And we're seeing it again this month with the passage of the Recovery Act, where the House Democrats moved very quickly to put together a package and then voted on it. And now the same thing is happening in the Senate, where they're negotiating the final details of this package right up until the second they're going to bring it to the floor, which means that very few members will have a full idea of everything that actually makes it in there and doesn't. Um, and that's a way to sort of try to ensure that people are on board, because you're telling them, we got the best deal we could, this is the only package we can put together that can get all 51 Democratic votes in the Senate. And so you better support it because it does all these things that we want. So let's talk a little bit more, more about the types of information that you're mentioning here, because I can imagine lots of different categories of information. Are there specific categories that you're focused on that lead to this kind of power structure? It's largely sort of policy information background and like basic knowledge and expertise about the policies at hand, which on any one policy, relatively few members have like a depth of understanding of the policymaking dynamics, what has been done, what is possible, what are all the different programs, what can you do, but then on top of that political information, and a lot of that is information about the negotiations. So if Nancy Pelosi goes in and negotiates with Mitch McConnell about what kind of legislative package can get through both a Democratic chamber and a Republican chamber, or can get through and be supported by Democrats in the House, but also Republicans in the Senate. Nobody else knows what's fully part of those negotiations and what was agreed to and what people said could or couldn't be included, except Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, such that they're the only ones who can return to their caucus and say, look, I've been fighting with Mitch McConnell about this for months. This is the best deal we can get. He won't accept this thing that you want, but he will accept this. And so this is what we have to pass. Well, that may be true, but obviously leadership is also going to present that in about as stark terms as possible so that members of the party who may not be super happy with the compromise that, that they were able to strike may realize and accept that it's the best possible compromise. And so they'll go along with the plan. No one else has that sort of political information about what was possible and what was not possible other than the leadership and you know potentially like maybe delegated some of these negotiations to the relevant committee chairs but it's people who are at the higher echelon of congress are the only ones that have that political information and those are also the same people that often are the only ones that have the kind of deep depth of knowledge and expertise and experience working in a particular policy area on particular programs and by the way these are the same people that also have all the really expert staff on capitol hill at their disposal because committee still house all the expert staff. They work for the chair. The party leadership often has access to them and has their own expert staff. And so kind of all of this together, policy information, policy knowledge, political information, um, knowledge about what's, when ha what happened in negotiations are all held by the same set of people over and over again. So I understand that the, that the leadership might have this advantage in saying this bill or this set of options inside a bill are more likely to pass than another or are the only way that can pass, right? Versus another set of options. So leadership seems to have this advantage in terms of identifying which options can pass and which ones will fail. Now, on the other hand, you have a different type of information, which is more expertise around the issue itself and whether the bill would work or not as law. Yeah right? Whether it is a good idea or a bad idea, what in unintended consequences there could be. That seems to be a different kind of information. Um, how does that work? Is it the same group of people or, you know, because I can imagine, you know, an expert in healthcare being outside of that little group uh, yeah. who, 
might have a very good idea of what's it, what that bill could, if it could work or, or, or not in, in reality. It's in many ways, it's often the same group of people, but not entirely. Part of the reason why it tends to be the same group of people is because it's the expert staff who work on the committees who tend to be the ones who know the most about the dynamics of the policies, as you just described it, what could work and what couldn't, like how should this be structured effectively. And those staff work for the committee chairs or the committee ranking members, or sometimes for the party leaders. Now, they aren't gonna be the only ones. There's always gonna be individual members of Congress who specialize in particular issue areas, right? Who That's what they've developed. That's the legislative portfolio they developed. They, even though they're not in that sort of leadership position, they're experts on healthcare or on education policy or on trade policy. That's a way that a member can actually force their way into the table, like, on, like to get a seat at the table because they are the ones who are gonna be able to credibly claim to their colleagues as well that I know a lot about this policy and I have a different view. Well, then it behooves the leadership and the committee leadership to bring those people to the table and get them to uh, be part of the decision making and get them to ultimately go along with the final plan because they can bring something to the table in terms of ideas, but they can also have influence over their colleagues because largely speaking, members of Congress look to the colleagues that they trust and that they see as knowledgeable in these issues when they're deciding whether or not they think they're going to go along with the plan, whether or not they think they're going to support this bill that's on the floor. So that's interesting. So on the one side, we have this idea of which options are possible. And then we have this concept of the option at hand is uh, credible, or it mm-hmm. is uh, defensible. Yeah. Uh, and in order to in, in order to convey that information, you have to kind of co opt these experts, because they could potentially put a, they can do an end run around the leadership on those particular issues if they came out against them. Yeah, no, so, I mean, think about this in terms of an issue. Say you're in the Senate and you're dealing with a bill that deals with financial services or consumer rights, Well, you're and you're the Democrats. Well, you're probably gonna make sure that you get Elizabeth Warren like on your team and she's backing it and she's out there saying that this is gonna do what it should do because she's seen by other members of Congress, by senators as somebody who has expertise in that space. And if she says that this is a good bill on financial services, a good bill on consumer rights, it does what we want to accomplish as a party on these things and you should support it, the vast majority of Democrats in the Senate are gonna be like, well, if Warren's for it, then why shouldn't I be for it? And there's different members on each of those different issues, but the common denominator every time is that Chuck Schumer is going to be there every single time as part of that process. And whoever the committee chairs are on the relevant committee chair, the chair of the finance committee, for instance, is always going to be part of that discussion too, because they also have the staff, they also have the clout, they also have the roles of being the people doing the political negotiations of managing that process that's going to have, make sure that they're at the table too. And so that's how you between like the policy knowledge and credibility and between like the like having the political knowledge and being involved in the political decision making that's who you see is actually these are the actual players on the issue and they're getting things together and they're able to convince usually their colleagues most more often than not to go along though obviously nothing's perfect and it doesn't work out for them every single time. And so let's talk about the this group that might go along or might not, right? Because there's obviously a reason that they're doing so. Typically, it'll be a politically sensitive issue in their district, right? Yes. Um, so how does that type of information play out in these these processes? Yeah. So those those are the if you're a party leader, those are the people you have to worry about, and it can vary from issue to issue, right? And it can vary depending on you whether you need to worry about. Uh, maybe your moderate flank or your more extreme flank, or sometimes both. So on something like the Recovery Act, if you're the Democratic leadership, you need to make sure you have to strike this balance, right? Where you need to make sure that the Recovery Act is set up well enough such that the most liberal progressive Democrats in the House and the Senate are comfortable with it. They think it does enough. And so they're willing to back it without too much complaining or without being able to threaten to, to walk away. But you also need to get the moderates on board, at least enough of them. In the Senate, you need all of them, which means you need Joe Manchin to sign on to it, and you also need Bernie Sanders to sign on to it, which isn't exactly the easiest thing to do. You know, and most of the time, it doesn't come down to needing every single member, right? It's rare that you have a situation like you have in the Senate right now, even within one party, where you need every single one of them to go along. But you do have to worry about losing too many people from any part of the party on any part of it or the issue. And that's where those people can potentially ensure themselves at least some part of the process. Where if you have a large enough subset of members within the party that 
might not be totally comfortable with the, what the party's game plan is, they're going to be able to negotiate with the leadership right away. So on something like if we go back a few years to when the Republicans were trying to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, you sent, you had a, something like the Freedom Caucus, which was about 30 members who are relatively hardline Republicans who wanted to see a repeal and replace measure that was more hardline. Those 30 members, if they were willing to band together, could make the difference between success or failure. But you also had a couple dozen members on the other side, these Tuesday group, more moderate Republicans, who also didn't want to see something that went too far. And so if you're the leadership, you need to find the right balance there. You need to bring in the experts you need to write a policy that has credibility from the people that are most involved in the Republican side on health policy, but also checks is able to be credibly explained to someone like Jim Jordan and the and more Mark Meadows and the Freedom Caucus as achieving hardline Republican goals of getting rid of Obamacare while being able to credibly claim to uh, these some of these more moderate two-state group Republicans that but it's not going to like harm people. It's not going to throw people off off their health care. It's not going to, you know, people are still going to be okay if they have pre-existing conditions. And that's very difficult. But if you have, the, if you're able to assemble your team to put together the bill, if you're able to assemble the experts, if you're able to assemble the people with the clout who can signal to these people that this checks all our boxes and you should be happy with it, that that's how you get there. That's how you get these people to go along. But, but of course, people who think that they might be in disagreement with the leadership. If they, have a, if they have the votes necessary to deny the leadership what they want to do, are going to be able to force their way into the room. So what about this concept of uh, an individual member who is looking at a bill and needs to analyze it on its own merits, uh, right, and read the bill, understand it, or understand its impact to his district? Uh, so you have that kind of ex- one end of the extreme, right? We call this the independent member. Mm-hmm. On the other side, you have one that, you know, will go along with what his own party or experts, you know, their opinion about this bill. Yeah. So since you've experienced the member side and you've seen the committee side, are there any members who are more of that independent learning leaning? You know, are, are they doing their own independent analysis of a bill and its impact on their, on their district over the long term? And how do they do it? Yeah, I mean... Well, there are some members who are more interested in that than others. And part of the reason is that these are members who have found in their careers that they are a little bit more out of step with their party than others. Members who are often find themselves always largely in lockstep with what most of their party wants. There's less of a need to do like to really try to dig in on your own because you trust more so what the, what the party is telling you, what the committee is telling you, because generally you found over and over again that what they wanted to do lines up with what you're comfortable with. But if you're a member that's a little bit unorthodox in your party, a little bit more out of step, now it behooves you to like, you're a little less trustworthy of what you're being told by the party because you don't believe that necessarily everything the party wants to do is what you want to do or what you think is gonna fly in your district. So you need to try to find a way to dig into what's being proposed to you independently of the leadership. And how do you do that is one of the most is one of the most difficult things on Capitol Hill if you're one of those members. Often the answer is that you can't because you just don't have, you're not given the time, you don't have the resources, and you don't necessarily have anybody who's in the know who you is necessarily credible to you. Sometimes you do. Sometimes there is somebody involved in the negotiations that you can, whose brain you can pick and be like, okay, you know, level with me. Why does this, how does this work for the things that I'm interested in or that you and I know that we're both interested in and lay that out for me and convince to me why I should still support this or not, you know, if not, I'm going to walk away. But sometimes you don't even have that. Working for Representative Lipinski was really, um, really telling on this, really like informative or educational on this because he was somebody who was often out of step with his own party. And that's what we spent a lot of time doing in his office, which was trying to find out Aside from the like, aside from the selling points and the talking points you were getting from the leadership about why you should support this, did we think this was something that we should support or that the representatives should, should support, given where he wanted to be on the issues and where he thought he needed to be because of his voters? And sometimes it was just a really hard thing to figure out. And it's been, you know, and there were only so many of us in his office. House members don't have that many staffers, and so you know, it was just a lot of long nights of trying to talk to who we could trying to get different opinions, but you can't even just go to the other side of the aisle because you don't necessarily trust them either. 
<laughs> so it's, it's a lot of, a lot of times it's, it's like, how do you do it? The answer is sometimes you like, you just won't satisfactorily. And if you ask enough members of Congress and their staff, most of them will tell you that most of the time they don't feel like they really had all the information that they could have really hoped or dreamed to have. But at the end of the day, they made a call based on what limited information that they had to the best degree possible. And for most members, that's essentially how they have to function day to day, except on maybe the couple issues where they have developed sort of real knowledge, real expertise, real experience. And if there were some kind of tool that a member could could leverage to get insights about the impact of a bill on their district, right? I'm assuming there is no such tool. Uh, <laughs> if there were, how would it be used? Would they, would these members then think about how does it impact my, based on your experience, would they, would they think about how does this, this measure impact my voters of different types, different geographic locations, different income levels, you know, how would they approach, I guess, analyzing a bill if they were actually to do so uh, and, and judge it on its merits, on its impact to the, to the, to the district? Yeah, I mean, impact on the district would be number one, and they'd want to know kind of exactly what you laid out. They'd want to know if this policy went into effect, how it would affect voters in my district, how would it affect different types of voters in my district, how would it affect different parts of my district if they have like a relatively like geographically or demographically diverse district, they'd want all that information. And, you know, it would vary from bill to bill, right? If it was the bill that dealt with healthcare, they'd want to know, okay, how will this affect healthcare costs or healthcare access in my district generally, and then potentially in different parts. Um, but they'd also want to know, like, that's the thing is like re-election is a big part of it, but they also have their also have their own like policy, their own policy preferences, their own things that they want to accomplish. They also all have a sense of what they think is good public policy, at least on a subset of issues. I'm sure there's always issues where some of them just don't care. Probably if you talk to most urban members, they don't care that much about farm policy. And if you talk to a lot of very rural farm oriented members, they don't care a whole lot about urban policy because it's just not relevant to them or their lives or their districts. But for the, at least for the issues they care about, sometimes they have their own sort of internal, like, or I would say that they almost always have their own internal, this is what I think good policy is. And they also want to know how these provisions that have been laid out uh, relate to what they would prefer to see on this policy or that policy, even independent of just how it affects their district. So they really, you know, an ideal situation would be as a member, you always had that information presented to you as you were given the opportunity to consider a bill, but there's trade-offs too, right? If you, suggest, if you largely support a legislative package that's being put together, even if you're frustrated not to have all the information you want on it, you also might be willing to support keeping that information under wraps if you think that information would be used by the opposition to kill it. Because all uh, at the end of the day, you still want to pass something. And even if you'd rather like, well, I'd really like to know exactly how it's going to affect my district so I can talk about that and I can think about that. I also don't want our political opponents to know, have that information because they may be able to find ways to make it look bad. And that's not good either. And so like, there's always these tensions there between what do you want as a representative? What do you want as you're making your vote? But also what do you want in, in order to be able to be able to talk positively about this accomplishment that maybe your party took the lead on backing in the Congress. And you don't, you don't want it to be blown up. You don't want it to look bad. You don't want there to be a lot of negative press towards you and your party for this effort if you can avoid it. Great. Well, let's move on to the concept of party. I know you've wrote, uh, written about that, uh, especially together with Francis Lee, who we've also talked to. Uh, why don't you give me your perspective, the questions I guess you're trying to answer about party and what you found so far there? Yeah. So like the big question in particular that Francis and I were going after was, you know, we've seen all this partisan change in our politics over the last couple generations, or at least over the last generation, we always say that the parties have polarized more than ever before. There's more party conflict. Each party is also more ideologically cohesive in terms of being more uniformly liberal or more uniformly conservative. And the question we wanted to know is, does, has this changed lawmaking at all? We've, we were struck by how little attention had been paid to that part of the question. We know it affected, has affected all sorts of things in terms of the type of party line voting we see in Congress. We know it's led to, or it's part of the reason that Congress has empowered their party leaders and empowered their party organizations. But has it helped the parties when they're in power get more of what they want in the policymaking process? Is the fact that they're so unified help them be able to like marshal through legislative programs the way that you see in more parliamentary systems? And so we dug into this and we found that the answer was largely no. 
Yeah, I think that's a very interesting outcome. Um, and I was surprised and asked Francis this, and I'll ask you the same. If they're spending so much time working on these kind of messaging politics and, you know, that's really, there's been a time shift, right, from, from I would assume, doing something like legislating and spending more time on messaging, right, which sounds to be like a trend. Um, just that that fact alone would say that there should be some kind of output change on the legislative side if they're spending less time doing it compared to doing something else. I don't know what you guys think about that or if you've seen anything in the data in terms of volume yeah. of legislation or quality of legislation or or what. So what I would say is it it's, can be deceptive. They spend less floor time considering substantive legislation. They spend more floor time considering messaging legislation, but they don't necessarily spend less, mess, more or less time as an institution generally working on substantive things. Just so much of it has moved behind the scenes and that has freed up the use of the floor to be a place where they largely debate things, use messaging vehicles and communicate with the public. Instead, they're spending a ton of time still writing policies behind the scenes, negotiating behind the scenes. And just these things tend to pass quickly and they tend to pass as part of humongous legislative packages such that you're not bringing up bill after bill after bill after bill on the floor to pass these policies. You're bringing them up together as one really big legislative package. Something like the package we saw in December, which was a combination of a bill that funded the government um, almost entirely for the coming fiscal year but also included what, however much it was, billion um, or trillion dollars in uh, COVID relief, 900 billion, I believe was the, was the number in December for the second round of COVID relief plan, plus all these other things that they had been working on in Congress over the last couple of years, all these other bills, all these other things about surprise medical billing, or this, there was this environmental legislation, or these other things that they've been working on, they just attached them all together and passed it at once which means you're spending less floor time passing substance, but it doesn't mean that you're actually passing less substance. And in fact, if you look at how many pages of new law are passed by Congress every year, it's been relatively steady since the 1980s. We often see that, we often perceive that Congress is less productive because we see these charts about how it's passing fewer and fewer laws than ever before, but those laws have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger by orders of magnitude, such that since, since really since the 1980s, the amount of law measured in pages that Congress has passed each year is staying relatively even. And it's actually way up from where it was in the 1950s. Yeah, I wonder what other ways there are to analyze that body of, uh, of law to see the change over time. Um, yeah. That's a, a, whole, a whole topic unto itself. Yes.